I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is 5.05 .05 on Wednesday, May 10th. Um, we'll begin, are there any guests or any petitions? Either here or online? Let's not make sure. Usually online, if there's anything, uh, just raise a hand. Fantastic, well then we will go directly to Gary um, for our facilities update. If you had anything you wanted to add in addition to your written report? Um, there really isn't anything that uh, I would like to add. We've got a lot of things going on down there with the renovation of a nurse suite, our staff lounge, um, potentially some classroom improvement this summer. So there's a lot going on down there. And uh, I won't be here to see it, but I'm excited to see where it goes. Rob, I'm, I'm sure, will tell me next year. All right, great. Um, did you have anything, or are there questions about the facilities for Gary? Any questions online for Gary? All right. Um, then what about an update on recruitment? Again, thank you for your report. Anything in addition to that? We've had a couple more kids accepted since I wrote this, so we are now over 150, which is, right. is good. Mm -hmm. That's a a threshold for some state funding. We need that for six semesters to, to get some additional money. So potentially, you know, next year can be one and two. So That's great. It is. What programs saw the additional students? So Diversified Ag has really has grown, is now full. Auto has a couple of spaces that we're holding for, for, for some kids. It's always our one of our most popular programs. We've seen a growth in Ed Services, which is great, and dental assisting. Uh, you know, dental assisting is a two-year-old program, so it's always nice to see those numbers increase, and uh, the same with Ed Services. That's great. And digital film also saw a pretty big increase as well. Oh, congratulations. Well, thanks. That's great. So any questions on, um, oh, do you, do you want to talk about current enrollment before I ask for questions? Again, I know you had a great report. Thank you. Yeah, we're at uh, you know 143, which is up from a couple of years ago. I think that's probably where we'll see numbers steady out and be around the 150 to 155 uh, range, which is good considering when you look at all the numbers that we have to pull from from our sending schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we pull in a pretty decent percentage of students, so. It's always good. So here in the room or online, any questions for Gary on recruitment or enrollment? Okay, quiet group. We're going to get right through this. Uh, so we'll go to our reports. Um, I know there is discussion of the attendance policy that was enclosed. Um, what points did we need to discuss on that? So attendance and the discussion around it, we, we started in leadership team two weeks ago. It extended into our staff meeting. We thought that it might be a short conversation, but we knew that it had the potential to um, really take off, which it has. And uh, would really like feedback, as would our our staff on two questions. I pose this to the staff and um, we're going to meet again of course to come and kind of boil what we've talked about down into something that, that we can put on paper. What is an absence and why does attendance matter? And I think that I don't want to speak for the rest of the district but I know that this is a district conversation as well so some of the feedback here tonight could possibly be used in other areas. So I'll open that up for, for anybody to, uh, to give feedback on. So I guess my first question is there's not a policy in place on what attendance looks like for the school district? So I can speak for the tech center. We sure. have, there was a, a policy before COVID that kind of laid things out. COVID, as we know, messed everything up and all semblance of normalcy. Um, so we're trying to come back to a, a firm policy. And right now in our handbook, around 20 absences 
could get you dismissed from program. Of course, that depends on a lot of factors, um, you know, medical issues, that type of, of stuff. Um, but it, there's really not a firm laid out policy, and I think that's what we are going for, and we're trying to, to hammer out with the understanding that there are, there's always gray area. Mm -hmm. But you know, why is attendance important, especially at, at our TCC? And then what are we going to consider an absence? Those can be loaded questions, potentially, but I would love the feedback. Yes, Anda. Yeah, just maybe curious about in, um, when you talk about attendance, and maybe this is what you're looking for uh, clarity on. Is, are you talking about daily attendance or or like um, period or class attendance? Do you have, do you differentiate between those? Like, are or is if someone misses something, are they count? Is that one of twenty total? Does that make sense as a question? Since we're a full day center, we really we take attendance in the morning, and of course we uh, know when a student's late or when they leave early and that type of stuff. And now the way that we do our scheduling with ELA, with humanities and math, attendance is taken during those blocks as well. I'm okay. unsure what the schedule is going to be like next year and how that's going to be handled. Uh, that's for Nika and the rest of the team to decide. But I think in my discussions with her, she would like to have something kind of vetted so that we can move forward. So she, she can have that July 1, or as close to July 1 as possible to move forward with. And that's the, the old policy laid out, you know, full days absences versus tardies and early dismissals. It was, it kind of got down almost to the hour, which mm -hmm. I would be open for discussion on that. Do we need to get that, that exact or do we just go with days and what's a day and you know they had a, the, the discussion was actually a, a pretty good one um, around the idea that hey you know for preparing these the, the students for you know work on actual job sites then maybe our attendance policies should kind of mimic what you know private industry does and so a lot of the discussion was kind of focused on that which i thought was a, a really kind of neat idea in terms of like district policy, we, we followed the state law, you know, at certain days, you know, we've got to send a letter home to the parents and let them know it when another threshold is crossed. And we actually have to report the students, uh, the ones that are, you know, compulsorily have to be here, um, you know, off to the court system, we try to get the court system involved. Um, district wide, we actually have very good attendance. Um, but the problem is, is that the handful of students that we have that need the court involvement, um, the courts are overworked, hard to get into, and they don't typically follow up. Um, and so at the district level, we want to put things in place that are going to help, you know, deal with those specific um, challenges. But I thought where they started the discussion in terms of, you know, let's mimic, mimic what they would experience um, in private industry was a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of good feedback from that stock conversation. And, uh, you know, it was interesting to hear their input and as professionals, we get 18 sick days and three personal days. So should the student policy mimic that? And there's a lot of really good conversation. We have a lot of um, really good people from industry that really shed light on the, the whole industry side of life. Well, I think <clears throat> working with a lot of businesses in Vermont, they have to be more adaptive to absences as well. Can they do work from home? Maybe not their full job, but if they're sick with COVID, I know a lot of businesses were looking like, well, can you do some paperwork while you're recovering, mm -hmm. you know, not be fully absent, so it wasn't considered an absence. Is that something where I know, like, the high school is very based on, on Google um, software for Google Docs and Google Classroom, so kids that are sick potentially could still log in from home, maybe get some work done. Is that something that RTCC could implement um, if it's a medical absence or a health concern absence in certain circumstances can they can we work with the student and the parent if they have high-speed internet if, is there mm -hmm. things i know tech is more hands-on it's really beneficial to be in the classroom but that might be one thing to talk about um, we expect so many hours or days in the classroom but mm -hmm. if a medical condition comes up we can help and there has been some of that that we've done excellent 
but it, it almost depends on the program exactly. that the student is in. Right. I mean, there's, there's always book work to do and some reading and reflection and humanities and math that can be done. Mm -hmm. They do miss that hands-on instruction. Uh, and, you know, we're potentially looking at ways that we can make that up. If a student were to miss three hours in a week, is there a time that we could get them with the instructor to make that up? I mean, it's, it's hard to recreate labs, but a lot of the talk that we had was around safety. I mean, some of these things you have to be in to uh, to really get the learning. So how can we meet in the middle and figure some of those things out? Yeah. Okay. So Sam, Anda, anything that you want to add or ask? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, this is a pain point in our business right now because we don't have the privilege of letting everybody work from home. So our theme right now is to try we're redoing our policies on sick leave and pto and um with regard to uh the pandemic and just need for bodies to be in the building so i i would say it sounds like you guys have talked about it and have had a good conversation i just say my two cents would be whatever it is make sure it's rigor it's it's uh accountable so it has some rigor to it and you can uphold it otherwise it's just going to be frivolous any other comments here there we talked a little bit about you know if they established kind of a threshold that you know beyond which there are potential consequences that there's a need for you know some sort of due process you know the kid student comes in kind of explains you know why they have the absences that they that they do um but i was kind of thinking about it on the drive over was the idea that in the workplace um you know one of the ways to possibly to determine if students can exceed that threshold is you know we apply the same rules in terms of uh, family medical leave that we do for employees Right, you know, so if they've got that sort of documentation, then that would be, you know, reasonable and, and probably acceptable, especially if we're trying to mimic what happens in the workplace. So. I mean, maybe you flip the script. Maybe you say for good attendance, you get X, Y, Z. You get Friday afternoon off. I don't know. You get to have fun. You get to have a gift card to Wait and Grit. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, but maybe there's something that you could do to reinforce coming to school besides being that much farther in education to be ready for the real world. But a lot of businesses are doing incentive programs for, you know, good attendance, going above and beyond. I mean, do we flip the script and, and come up with a reward system for lack of a better term for attendance? Incentive, yeah. I think I'm a little more old school on this um, in that I think when there's a culture that is one that kids want to be a part of and it's open and there are is motivation to attend um, when there is enthusiasm in the classroom um, you know I I hear a lot um, about the amount of absences that teachers do have and they're like well our teachers aren't here so you know and that trickles down to the students and so I think when there's that culture where I want to learn I want to be engaged this is my future and I think for the tech center we have that more because so often that student is going directly to the workforce and so to be able to get as much as you can get in those days and the day is already kind of short I mean it's nine to two um, and we're cramming a lot in there so I guess that um, my opinion is gonna be different in that I think it's, attendance is mandatory. I mean, obviously if you're sick um, or if you have a family medical leave situation, you know, my appendix burst and I'm gonna be out for this amount of time or, you know, I had a death in my family. Those to me are all unique situations that are brought forth to the administrative team to be managed and approved, taken, you know, to make up the work somehow. Um, so I, I think that attendance should be more rigid in the expectation um, because where I work, 
you don't go to work every day, there's patients not being taken care of. I mean, your job, it's a, the snowball effect is huge right. on, um, on being there every day um, outside of the normal kind of things why I'm not. So I would look more to something more strict on expectations yeah. for my feedback. And yeah. the, the reward piece could be something like at the end of the year, you know, you've had perfect attendance all the year, so during the recognition ceremony. Right, right. Um, that that celebration, um, you know, or you know, in perfect attendance for four years. I mean, that should be something that's you know celebrated and recognized. Um, but I agree with that. Actually, you're setting the expectation of what's going to have to be met in the workforce. Yep. If if you're going for the nursing degree, it's expected that you're going to be there. Um, even if you continue your education and you go to a university or, or a higher education purpose, you're expected to be there and have attendance as well. So. I do know there used to be a perfect attendance policy of some sort, but that was another thing that kind of fell with COVID. Um, I don't know exactly like what benefits they got with that perfect attendance, but it was something that um, they used to calculate every quarter. Kids who had perfect attendance for the quarter would receive a certificate. I don't know if there was something bigger than the certificate. I can't speak to that. Um, but my first year here was coming back from COVID and they're like, we can't do this because we can't even expect everybody to be here because we're having them out for five and 10 days at a time. So um, it was there at one point. I just don't know how high of a reward it was well, then. Students might not understand this now, but if you put that on your resume going into the job force that you had really, uh, you got recognized for good attendance in your tech center and your school, you know, as someone that's looking for employees right now, that's a that's a major like. Yeah. Oh, you showed up! Oh, great! Thank you. <laughs> You're in this pile. Yay! Yeah. Uh, it, and explain to them like this is what employers look for when when picking a candidate to come work for them. So. And. Uh yeah, so I, I I like this discussion. We're definitely having similar conversations down at White River Valley. Uh, it feels like the days of perfect attendance that are gone, right? Like we're I don't know if that's like that. I don't know if that's the exact right goal that we should be setting. I think I th right. Like so, I think they're one because I think right you miss something and you have no control over it, and then that that idea of even trying to get there by the end of the year is gone. You know, in October for some reason. So I but I do think there could be a band of somewhere where this is like that's considered you know, excellent attendance and it's got some, there's gotta be some wiggle room in there. Cause I just, I think for, for a variety of reasons, people are gonna miss something um, as we all do, right? Like I just, I don't think that making 177 days or 175 is gonna be possible. But I think, I think setting some sort of expectation of this is what, you know, this is what we're aiming for. Um, someone mentioned earlier, right? Like there's just thinking about, you know, sick days and, and personal days that adults have something in between there that recognizes that. Um, I think would be good. I, and I think thinking too about, I like the comment about whether it's about the culture, people want kids wanting to be there, students wanting to be there and learning everything. So like, how do we continue to lead with like the, the why behind it, right? This can't just be a compliance piece. There has to be, you know, a, the, the purpose of wanting to be in the building and getting all, getting all of the, the training and the learning that the students are getting um, and continuing to sort of lead with that rather than this is, this is just about compliance because I think you know students at this age are going to you have to have a, you're going to start making different choices if it if it feels like it, that's what it's about rather than about their their learning and growth. How close are we at capacity with students? Are we at capacity of what we can take? We're about fifty off. Okay. So I guess I should have premised this conversation. We're we have a few kids that are struggling with attendance. We really don't have attendance issues like we have right. in the past. The reason I ask is if, if we're at capacity and people got turned down from coming from a different school and we chose these students that are here and they're not meeting that expectation of coming to school but somebody else was waiting to come in like I you know the percentage expectations again like you're being picked to come here like we're choosing you to come here we expect you to come here and, and participate I mean that may be another way to frame it up when we're doing the so I mean there's recruiting. definitely programs that are maxed out there are yes. mm, yeah. not all of them but there are programs that are maxed out so those programs would be good examples of that yeah, yeah. like you should most definitely be here because there are kids who didn't get in because 
Yeah, Twenty applied. We're taking twelve. You're one of the twelve. Congratulations. Here's our expectations. You know, these other eight couldn't get in, but you are expected to show up. Have, I, again, I, as good attendance as you can. Medical stuff, all that happens. But yep. just kind of like, hey, you made it. Good job. But now, this is what we expect. Yep. Any other feedback for Gary? Like from us here, besides uh, more of my opinion. <laughs> I'll yeah, take, I'll I've take, always got that. Yeah, you can just come in and give me all your opinions. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you want that. <laughs> I mean, I only have uh, I think seven weeks left, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So come on in all you want right. after seven yeah. weeks. Right. And that door is open. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything else. You know, okay. I appreciate the opportunity. My first and last one here. And, my door is always open and call, email with whatever questions you have or feedback to really help that place hit its potential because it, yeah. it's special. And I think we're just, we're getting to where we're going to see it. Great. So. He's been, he's been doing a really good job of getting things set up for Nika in the fall and kind of foundational parts and pieces that need to be in place. And so it's, uh, it's, it's um, very grateful uh, for the effort and the work that you put in. Thank you. Uh, Lane, did you have anything in addition to the enclosed report that you wanted to share or touch um, on? Uh, basic stuff. Um, they're, you know, financially, um, you know, we keep track of the, the financials at this point in time. Ten months of the fiscal year it up, so we, we would expect about 17% of the budget to be left. Um, they're at like 35%. They are well in the black. Um, uh, so that's they're, they're in good shape um, right now. Um, eventually, you're going to touch on the uh, reserve request for a new vehicle. Um, typically, what happens why that's here is it's um, appropriate under uh, the state regs is that the advisory board, you know, at least has considered it and gives a recommendation to the OSSD board um, that, that that recommendation is considered. Uh, a little bit later. So one of the things that they're doing is they're they're looking to uh, replace uh, a, an Acadia SUV. I think it's like 2006. That's top. That's top. Yeah, that's and it's um, it's pretty beat up. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got some body integrity issues with rust and whatnot. It, it is more than time to to, to to replace it. So just so so folks know. Um, Put your order in now. Yep. Yeah. It's yeah. There's nine months wait. Some Yeah, we had we had we had two we had two years two years wait during the middle of COVID yeah, on yeah. yeah some of the vehicle replacements. It was crazy. It's gotten better, but it's it's Good. not perfect. Um, and as um, I think Gary kind of alluded to, is the a lot of the facilities work that is going on in there right now they're swapping the the staff room space the staff were great they said yeah go ahead the staff room the, fa the faculty room space for the um the nurse's office um to give the nur nurses uh, a little bit more area as well as it's in a more private location so that work is ongoing um, they began a discussion um, which has long been needed about the seven bay garage um, some people may know where that is it's it's out in the field there it's used for storage um, that old garage is, uh, it doesn't have a foundation under it. It's, it's literally bare ground. Um, you know, there's holes in the, in the walls and chinks in the boards um, that surround it. The roof is starting to come undone. And so the discussion is, you know, do we just remove it at this point in time and not replace it, or do we replace it with something else? So they're in discussions right now that they do want to continue with the storage, um, but the storage needs are different depending upon the, the, the team that uses it. Um, you know, in some, some cases, you know, um, it, it, it needs to be much more, you know, waterproof and temperature controlled. In some cases, it does not. Um, so I expect to see kind of movement on that, and that'll come back to this board for approval once a, a plan is in place. Um, but pretty much, uh, I think the only other thing to kind of put on people's mind is that as the legislature is looking at transitioning to providing construction funds, um, potentially, uh, this complex, RTCC and RUHS, you know, were, when the state did its study, were found to be um, the buildings uh, the closest to the end of their useful life across the state. And so we've been having some minor discussions about, you know, 
fighting um, and building a, a new facility uh, to house both. And so I think one of the things that we'll bring up at the board tonight is to, to see the interest that's there um, and may be able to start moving forward at least on um, some studies to see what can be done. You know, looking, looking for a potential space, get some architectural advice in here, get some architectural drawings done of what it could look like. Um, starting to have some very direct um, communications with the community about, you know, what, what they desire if this happens. Has anybody inquired to BTC what their future plans is with that facility up there? Uh, we've actually discussed that. I think Ashley had even brought that up uh, a couple years ago um, at one point in time. Um, there's the possibility um, that as they are looking to give up some of the buildings and some of the space up there because they don't need as much, mm -hmm. um, that you know it could be possible potentially to buy you know a good chunk of that space. Um, the problems that would have to be examined as part of the study is the fact that they have done, you know, it's been deferred maintenance on a lot of those buildings. Okay. So, you know, getting in, you know, what would be the cost of actually purchasing it and then what would be the additional cost of, of renovations and things to get it up to our needs and to mm -hmm. deal with any of the deferred maintenance that's happened. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a definitely a good possibility, but there's a lot of discussion, a lot of study that would have to happen around it. Just being a tech school for the tech center, yeah. like, you know, it just would be kind of cool if, you know, they had plans on doing something different and you have the automotive, you have the ag, you have, you know, mechanical engineering and you've got a nice gym, you've got a pool, you could bring in a swimming team, you could, there's a lot of possibilities right yeah. off the interstate, right up on the hill, so I didn't know if. Yeah, no, like I said, I think the, the big thing is to, to see, my, my goal tonight is to try to get the OSSD board to charge me with beginning that study. Um, and then uh, that, those are, are questions that that'll, that'll be a part of it. Cool. But yeah. Does that require Act 250 for your school? I have no idea. Um, here, I think the, the initial plan that has been talked about, um, actually started some conversations with the community at the beginning of the year about it was the idea that, you know, we need a place for the kids to continue to go to school while construction commences. Right. So, you know, one of the ideas was having the, the engineers to come out and do a study, you know, I guess under Act 250 would be like the watershed studies, the things that would have to happen about how it affects the drainage, especially around the, um, the river here. But it um, potentially to build on what are now the athletic fields so that this complex can still be used while that construction is happening. When that is complete, move the kids over, this complex comes down and the athletic fields are, are put out in front of the building here, um, which will give us an opportunity to really revamp the fields and make sure they're, they're up to snuff and they're safe. Um, those fields have been fantastic, um, but there's a lot of maintenance that they, they really need to make sure that the ground hasn't become compacted, um, which leads to injuries when the, the kids fall. Um, and so it would be a good way to kind of start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if we're gonna spend 100 and 70 million, 175 million on a complex potentially. Um, you know, do we want to spend an extra 900,000 to put in a turf field with lights um, and, you know, be a central location um, within the state for people to come and have their, you know, their big uh, competitions and, and kind of end of season events? Um, you know, it could, could be a, a game changer for a lot of things. There's something that the Brunswick School could use as well if we put in the turf and the bigger yeah. fields and. Yeah. Potentially collaborate. The the, the turf is is great. Um, it's uh, it usually it lasts about ten years. The schools I've been in that where we put it in, mm -hmm. um, it does require some maintenance. It does have to be replaced after about ten years of use, but um, it drains incredibly well. There's uh, you can use it year year round. You can, uh, the lights are fantastic. But Vermont, one of the nice things is that even if you've got the grass still, it heals really quickly. It's one of the nice yeah. things about Vermont. So if we had the lights out there, as long as the neighbors were in agreement, you know, we had an agreement with the neighbors when they could be on and when they had needed to be off, that in itself would be a, a big boom. Well, um, it seems like Randolph's really trying to increase their rec area yeah. with the mountain biking and the, the, like, the pool and the basketball courts and just everything in Randolph. Yeah. It'd be nice to have a track. Yeah. If they ever get the, if they ever get the, um, the hotel built, you know, this would be an ideal place to, like I said, Central and Vermont. Yeah, tournaments. Um, to do those, those big sporting playoffs. events. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. All right, so you touched on financials. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a consent agenda. 
Uh, I say we're going to have to pull the two pieces apart uh, to approve the minutes, and then um, unless we want to vote on the reserve fund requests, unless there's additional questions on that, do we want to keep it together? So we can either keep it together or pull it apart. I'm good keeping it together okay. unless there's an argument to pull it apart. All right, then let's move forward on the consent agenda. I need a motion to approve the minutes of February 8th um, and to approve the reserve fund request to purchase a new Acadia to replace an aging Tahoe. I approve that request. Can you can make a motion. I'll make a motion. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Um, now I have to ask if there's any questions. Before we take a vote, any questions on those two things? Hearing, I, oh yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Sam. I just had one quick question. Um, what's the reason it has to be an SUV? So we transport a lot of students and a lot of these programs are very mobile. So an SUV works really well for that. We have our pickups and our newly acquired one ton uh, Dually with the dump box. Um, that Tahoe gets used quite a bit to, especially for our dental students and their externships. And our work based learning coordinator also uses that to, uh, to go and visit businesses and take students on shadows and that type of stuff. And it doesn't require a special and license. It doesn't require a special license. I was going to say, I mean, I'm more of a Ford guy myself, so it <laughs> pains me to see this Acadia, but I'll trust Howie on his judgment. It would be it would be nice if we could have kind of an activities bus, where and everybody could have their license, and we could haul everybody in a program at once. But mm -hmm. I think that might be a little ways off. But we do um, just just uh, to put it out there, we can talk with Nika about this as follow up. Um, our we're one of the few districts that still does its own buses. We don't contract out. Um, Danny has the capacity up there. He does the training to train the, the, the bus drivers to get their, their CDLs. Oh, perfect. Um, so if anybody is interested in going through that training with him, um, you know, he does it regularly um, as we have new staff come on that, that, that need the license. So, yeah. Right on. Okay. I, uh, as Elon Musk keeps dropping the price of Tesla, I hope you guys keep one in mind. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll charge you the electric bill. How's right. that? Noted, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we'll plug it in at your facility. All right. So all, um, I'm going to go ahead and take a vote. So all in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. aye. Or raise aye. your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? That was unanimous, Robin. Thank you. Um, any other items we need to discuss as a group this evening? Is there any other trade programs that maybe students have had shown interest in that we don't provide that we should talk about implementing in the next few years? Uh, plumbing has been brought up mm -hmm. to me, n not so much from students, but from more like a need in the community of having plumbers in the area. But is there anything else that the Plumbing and HVAC, definitely. HVAC, yeah. 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 There, there's been some discussion, but I don't know, because the potential is there, I don't know what the student interest would be um, in the past. The H, HVAC has been discussed before, but with the added component of, of uh, solar panel installation combined with um, heat exchangers, right, because that's a, a growing industry at this point in time. Um, the other piece that, that's been discussed is uh, the electric vehicle, you know, um, certifications and, and being able to get an electric vehicle and have the kids learn how to do those, mm -hmm. that work and those repairs. Okay. So, yeah. And you talk about implementing solar to, if we were building a new building, that, yep. yeah, that'd be, okay. Yeah, we, we had actually examined it um, for the district four or five years ago, uh, prior to COVID, it's hard to keep all the, all the, the time straight anymore. Um, the problem at the time was uh, Green Mountain Power and the regulators had a limit on how much you could generate on a site. Okay. And so when we looked at that compared to what our needs were, it just wasn't going to be cost effective. You know, if we could build it and cover all our needs at, at once, that's yeah. awesome. 
And so um, one of the things that I've asked the facilities directors to do, this is actually a couple months ago, so I got to follow up with them, was to find out if those regulations had changed in terms of you know how big a generation site you can have. Good. Any other classes? I mean, I know in my line of work, um, having announcers or people that know how to speak articulate on the air is getting few and far between. To put that into a younger generation, podcasting, live streaming, influencers, it seems like there's a big interest in the younger generation to explore that. Would that be anything to revisit as far as maybe like with digital? Or I think that's why you see such a bump in digital. Yeah, film. okay. Yeah. But maybe implement how to speak and how to prepare, like what you're going to talk about. And we find there's a big disconnect with people coming to us, be like, I love talking. Yeah, so do I. But, you know, and, and to be ready and prepare and I'm not going to say. And some of those things, uh, what I've recommended for next year is mm -hmm. that the uh, work based learning coordinator teach at least a day a week Yep. and teach those things. I mean, I, I was an ag teacher for about 10 years and an FFA advisor, and that's what we really hammered on yes. was public speaking and, and all of those soft skills that people are looking for. Perfect. So, so I, I mean, I've recommended that that kind of be put in for everybody, not just one particular right. program. But Well, and there's, you know, like WCBR in town, they do our high school basketball games. It, it'd be great if, like, a student was, like, calling the game or, you know, just practicing and using that platform. I'm with DEB. We do games all over the state as well. We're always looking for help or to teach people how to do it. So, and then doing their own podcast and stuff. It's a, it's a big media shift in the last three years, podcasting. So, yeah. I know the kids have interest. Gary, is there an FFA program here? There is. Really? That's great. Diversified Ag. Okay. Is it um, active? I mean, there's there are some incredible life skills. It's getting to be more that way. It's great. Ryan and I, I was the pre-tech instructor last year, for those that don't know, so I was helping Ryan to kind of build that. I had a very successful program in Iowa, and it's, I know FFA is a lot different there than here. Yeah. Um, but I've been talking with him because he wants that program to be, mm -hmm. I mean, it can only be as big as his actual program is, but wants it to be active and successful. So I've tried to give him some guidance and input on that, and I think it will get there. That's fantastic. Um, I, I love FFA. It does so much for students, but it'll get there. Yeah. It's exciting. And they're preparing for an FFA convert convention next Friday. Next Friday. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Those public speaking opportunities in FFA are huge. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great. Thanks. On a related topic, um, we're recommending for hire another math teacher who has um, a significant background in business. And we'll be able to teach accounting and entrepreneurship and using spreadsheets and other things that are, will be related to all the programs. Um, and so while we're adding these extra English teacher and extra math teacher, we're hoping to build more of these skills that will be universal, like you said, public speaking, right? But, and also entrepreneurship. Excellent. A lot of, um, it seems like a lot of younger people are having that frame of mind of, being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. versus just going into the workforce. Yeah, they're calling um, it the gig economy. Yeah. Even talking to seniors who are graduating this year, friends of the family, I'm like, it's like, I want to go into business and marketing. I'm like, great, who are you going to work for after college? It's like, myself. <laughs> I'm like, great. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it seems to be like a, a shift. So. Yeah. so, sorry, Sam. I know you're looking for workers. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so is there any reason for an executive session? No? All right. Well, with no further business, um, we can adjourn at 545.